Hello, this is R.J. Deacon reading the Supreme Court of the United States Opinion Syllabus in American Legion versus American Humanist Association. Certiori to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Argued February 27th, 2019. Decided June 20th, 2019. In 1918, residents of Prince George's County, Maryland, formed a committee for the purpose of erecting a memorial for the county's soldiers who fell in World War I. The committee decided that the memorial should be a cross, which was not surprising since the plain Latin cross had become a central symbol of the war. The image of row after row of plain white crosses marking the overseas graves of, graves of soldiers was emblazoned on the minds of Americans at home. The memorial would stand at the terminus of another World War I memorial, the National Defense Highway, connecting Washington to Annapolis. When the committee ran out of funds, the local American Legion took over the project, completing the memorial in 1925. The 32-foot-tall Latin cross displays the American Legion's emblem at its center and sits on a large pedestal bearing inter alia a bronze plaque that lists the names of 49 county soldiers who had fallen in the war. At the dedication ceremony, a Catholic priest offered an invocation, and a Baptist pastor offered a benediction. The Blazenberg Cross has since been the site of patriotic events honoring veterans on Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Monuments honoring the veterans of other conflicts have been added in a park near the cross. As the area around the cross developed, the monument came to be at the center of a busy intersection. In 1961, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission acquired the cross in the land where it sits. But the American Legion resolved, or reserved the right to continue using the site for ceremonies. The commission has used public funds to maintain the monument ever since. In 2014, the American Humanist Association and others filed suit in district court alleging that the cross's presence on public land and the commission's maintenance of the memorial violate the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. The American Legion intervened to defend the cross. The district court granted summary judgment for the commission and the American Legion concluding that the cross satisfies both the test announced in Lemon v. Kurtzman and the analysis applied by Justice Breyer in upholding a Ten Commandments monument in Van Orden v. Perry. The Fourth Circuit reversed. The Supreme Court held the judgment is reversed and remanded. And... Let's see. Justice Alito announced the judgment of the court. Justice Alito delivered the opinion of the court with respect to parts 1, 2b, 2c, 3, and 4, conclu concluding that the Bladensburg Cross does not violate the Establishment Clause. At least four considerations show that retaining established religiously expressive monuments, symbols, and practices is quite different from erecting or adopting new ones. First, these cases often concern monuments, symbols, or practices that were first established long ago, and thus identifying their original purpose or purposes may be especially difficult. See Salazar versus Buno. Second, as time goes by, the purposes associated with an established monument, symbol, or practice often multiply as in the Ten Commandments monument addressed in Van Orden and McCreary County versus American Civil Liberties Union of Kentucky. Even if the monument's original purpose was infuse, infused with religion, the passage of time may obscure that sentiment, and the monument may be retained for the sake of his, its historical significance or its place in a common cultural heritage. Third, the message of a monument, symbol, or practice may evolve. Pleasant Grove City versus some, as is the case with a city name like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Arizona's motto, Diet Deus, Deus God in Riches, uh, adopted in 1864, 
or Maryland's flag, which has included two crosses since 1904. Familiarity itself can become a reason for preservation. Fourth, when time's passage imbues a religiously expressive monument, symbol, or practice, with this kind of familiarity, familiarity and historical significance, removing it may no longer appear neutral, especially to the local community. The passage of time thus gives rise to a strong presumption of constitutionality. The cross is a symbol closely linked to World War I. The United States adopted it as part of its military honors, establishing the Distinguished Service Cross and the Navy Cross in 1918 and 1919, respectively and the fallen soldiers' final resting places abroad were marked by white crosses or stars of David, a solemn image that became inextricably linked with and symbolic of the ultimate price paid by 116,000 soldiers. This relationship between the cross and the war may not have been the sole or dominant motivation for the design of the many war memorials that sprang up across the nation, but that is all but impossible to determine today. The passage of time means that testimony from the decision makers may not be available. And regardless of the original purposes for erecting the monument, a community may wish to preserve it for very different reasons, such as the historic preservation and traffic safety concerns noted here. The area surrounding a monument, like the Bladenburg's, Bladensburg Cross, may also have been altered in ways that change its meaning and provide new reasons for its preservation. Even the AHA recognizes that the monument's surroundings are important, as it concedes that the presence of a cross monument in a cemetery is unobjectionable, but a memorial's placement in a cemetery is not necessary to create a connection to those it honors. Memorials took the place of gravestones for those parents and other relatives who lacked the means to travel to Europe to visit the graves of their war dead and for those soldiers whose bodies were never recovered. Similarly, memorials and monuments honoring important historical figures, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, as an example, often include a symbol of faith that was important to the persons whose lives are commemorated. Finally, as World War I monuments have endured through the years and become a familiar part of the physical and cultural landscape requiring their removal or alteration would not be viewed by many as a neutral act. Few would say that California is attempting to convey a religious message by retaining the many city names like Los Angeles and San Diego, given by the original Spanish settlers. But it would be something else entirely if the state undertook to change those names. Much the same is true about Mon monuments to soldiers who sacrificed their lives for this country more than a century ago. Applying this principle here, or these principles here, the Bladensburg Cross does not violate the Establishment Clause. The image of the simple wooden cross that originally marked the graves of American soldiers killed in World War I became a symbol of their sacrifice, and the design of the Bladensburg Cross must be understood in light of that background. That the cross originated as a Christian symbol and retains that meaning in many contexts does not change the fact that the symbol took on an added secular meaning when used in World War I memorials. The cross has also acquired historical importance with the passage of time, reminding the townspeople of the deeds and sacrifices of their predecessors as it stands among memorials to veterans of later wars. It has, thus, become part of the community. It would not serve that role had its design deliberately disrespected area soldiers. But there is no evidence that the names of any area Jewish soldiers were either intentionally left off the memorial's list or included against the wishes of their families. The AHA tries to connect the cross in the American Legion with anti-Semitism and the Ku Klux Klan, but the monument, which was dedicated during a period of heightened racial and religious animosity, includes the name of both black and white soldiers, and both Catholic and Baptist clergy participated in the dedication. It is also natural and appropriate for a monument commemorating the death of particular individuals to invoke the symbols that signify what death meant for those who were memorialized. Excluding those symbols could make the memorial seem incomplete. This explains why Holocaust memorials invariably feature a Star of David, 
or other symbols of Judaism, and why the memorial at issue features the same symbol that marks the graves of so many soldiers near the battlefields where they fell. The fact that the cross is undoubtedly a Christian symbol should not blind one to everything else that the Bladensburg cross has come to represent, a symbolic resting place for ancestors who never returned home, a place for the community to gather and honor all veterans and their sacrifices for this nation, and a historical landmark. For many, destroying or defacing the cross would not be neutral and would not further the ideals of respect and tolerance embodied in the First Amendment. Justice Alito, joined by the Chief Justice, Justice Breyer, and Justice Kavanaugh, concluded in Parts 2A and 2D. Lemon ambitiously attempted to fashion a test for all establishment cause cases. The test called on courts to examine the purposes and effects of a challenged government action, as well as any entanglement with religion that it might entail. The expectation of a ready framework has not been met. The court has many times either expressly declined to apply the test or simply ignored it. See, for example, Zobrest versus California Foothills School District and Town of Greece versus Galloway. The Lemon Court ambitiously attempted to find a grand unified theory of the establish Establishment Clause, but the court has since taken a more modest approach that focuses on the particular issue at hand and looks to history for guidance. The cases involving prayer before legislative sessions are illustrative. In Marsh v. Chambers, the U.S. Court upheld a state legislature's practice of beginning each session with a prayer by an official chaplain, finding it highly persuasive that Congress, for over 200 years, had opened its sessions with prayer, and that many state legislatures had followed suit. In the court in town of Greece, reason that the historical practice of having since the first Congress, chaplains in Congress showed that the framers considered legislative prayer a benign acknowledgement of religion's role in society. Where monuments, symbols, and practices with long-standing history follow in tradition of the first Congress in respecting and tolerating different views, endeavoring to achieve inclusivity and non-discrimination, and recognizing the important role religion plays in the lives of many Americans, they are likewise constitutional. Justice Thomas, agreeing that the Bladensburg Cross is constitutional, concluded, The text and history of the clause, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, suggests that it should not be incorporated against the states. When the court incorporated the clause in Everson v. Board of, Board of Education of Ewing, it apparently did not consider that an incorporated establishment clause would prohibit exactly what the text of the clause seeks to protect, state establishments of religion. The appropriate question is whether any long-standing right of citizenship restrains the states in the establishment context. Further confounding the incorporation question is the fact that the First Amendment, by its terms, applies only to a laws enacted by Congress. Even if the clause applied to state and local governments in some fashion, the mere presence of the monument along respondent's path involves no actual legal concern or coercion. The sine qua non of an establishment of religion. Van Orden versus Perry. The plaintiff, claiming an unconstitutional establishment of religion, must demonstrate that he was actually coerced by government contact, conduct that shares the characteristics of an establishment as understood at the founding. Respondents have not demonstrated that maintaining a religious display on public property shares any of the historical characteristics of an establishment of religion. Town of Greece versus Galloway. The Bladensburg Cross is constitutional, even though the cross has religious significance. Religious displays or speech need not be limited to those considered non-sectarian. Insisting otherwise is inconsistent with this nation's history and traditions. That's the majority opinion. 
and would force the courts to act as supervisors and censors of religious speech. The plurality rightly rejects the relevance of the test set forth in Lemon v. Kurtzman to claims like this one, which involve religiously expressive monuments, symbols, displays, and similar practices. But Justice Thomas would take the logical next step and overrule the Lemon test in all contexts. The test has no basis in the original meaning of the Constitution. It has been manipulated to fit whatever results the court aimed to achieve. Uh, McCreary County versus American Civil Liberties Union of Kentucky. And it continues to cause enormous confusion in the states and the lower courts. Justice Gorsuch, joined by Justice Thomas, concludes that a suit like this one should be dismissed for lack of standing. The American Humanist Association claims that its members come into regular, unwelcome contact with the Bladensburg Cross when they drive through the area. But this offended observer theory of standing has no basis in law. To establish standing to sue consistent with the Constitution, a plaintiff must show 1. Injury in fact, 2. Causation, and 3. Redressability. And the injury in fact must be concrete and particularized. That's Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. This court has already rejected the notion that offense alone qualifies as a concrete and particularized injury sufficient to confer standing, Diamond versus Charles. And it has done so in the context of the Establishment Clause itself. See Valley Forge Christian College versus Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Offended observer standing is deeply inconsistent, too, with many other long-standing principles and precedents, including the rule that generalized grievances about the conduct of government are insufficient to confer standing to sue. That's Schlesinger versus Reservist Commission to Stop the War. And the rule that a party's gen party generally must assert its own legal rights and interests, not those of third parties, Kowalski versus Tesmer, Lower courts invented offended observer standing for Establishment Clause cases in response to Lemon v. Kurtzman, reasoning that if the Establishment Clause forbids anything that a reasonable observer would view as an endorsement of religion, then such an observer must be able to sue. Lemon, however, was a misadventure, and the court today relies on a more modest, historically sensitive approach. Interpreting the Establishment Clause with reference to historical practices and understandings. The monument here is clearly constitutional in light of the nation's traditions. Although the plurality does not say it in as many words, the message of today's decision for the lower courts must be this. Whether a monument, symbol, or practice is old or new, apply Town of Greece versus Galloway, not Lemon. Because what matters when it comes to assessing mon a monument, symbol, or practice is not its age, but its compliance with ageless principles. With Lemon now shelled, little excuse will remain for the anomaly of offended observer standing, and the gaping hole it tore in standing doctrine in the courts of appeals should now begin to close. Abandoning offended observer standing will mean only a return to the usual demands of Article 3 requiring a real controversy with real impact on real persons to make a federal case out of it. Justice Alito announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respect to parts 1, 2B, 2C, 3, and 4, in which Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Kavanaugh joined. And an opinion with respect to parts 2A and 2D, in which Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Breyer and Kavanaugh joined, Justice Breyer filed a concurring opinion, in which Justice Kagan joined. Justice Kavanaugh filed a concurring opinion. Justice Kagan filed an opinion concurring in part. Justice Thomas filed an opinion concurring in the judgment. Justice Gorsuch filed an opinion concurring in the judgment, in which Justice Thomas joined. Justice Ginsburg filed a dissenting opinion, in which Justice Sotomayor joined. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to get a hold of the podcast, we can be reached at RhodesScholar80 at gmail.com. That's R-O-A-D-S and 8-0. And 
on Twitter at Court Syllabus.